Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle podcast, where business owners learn to thrive as we strive. On this show, we sit down with industry-leading experts about developing self-awareness, impacting your niche, and striving to live the best life possible. Our mission is to encourage ambitious pursuits in a heart-healthy way through intentional conversation and increasing self-awareness. Why heart-healthy? Because burnout and stress are global epidemics. We're discussing tools that help you to navigate business ownership successfully. So whether you're driving to or from work right now, exercising, eating, or simply relaxing, come hang out and get ready to enjoy another inspiring episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle Show. Welcome back, everybody, to another inspiring episode of the Heart Healthy Hustle podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Frederick. Today's guest is co-founder and CEO of Size Slim Supplements, a sports nutrition company and co-founder of an elite men's health clinic focused on lifestyle optimization. He's a health enthusiast, an entrepreneur, and a devoted family man. His name is Adam Lamb. Adam took the same drive that enabled him to become a competitive bodybuilder and to successfully run two companies and then channeled it into his commitment to quit drinking on his quest to a next level lifestyle. Adam believes living a life of abundance all starts with self-awareness. Adam enjoys digging deep to the root of things, which has helped him in business relationships, personal relationships, and the relationship with himself. Adam wrote the book, Better Than the Binge. After the first 90 days of removing alcohol from his life, he was so motivated to share his story with others because he believes so many people can benefit from gaining self-awareness around alcohol consumption. Adam, it's a real privilege to have you on the show. Welcome. Hey, thanks, Jonathan. I'm excited to be on the show and and see where I can add some value to your listeners here at the Heart Healthy Hustle and excited about the interview with you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Go ahead and fill in any space from that intro. Let people know what a day in life looks like. That's a good question. I think you did a great job. It was a, it was a mouthful, and, and thanks for including everything in there. You know, I'm, my the day in the life is probably nothing really exciting. <laughs> I, I I get up, get my kids up, make them breakfast, go to the gym, emails, and those kind of things, and then spend the rest of my day working and, and doing whatever needs to be done. What's a favorite success quote or saying you live by? I think if you have the same quote you live by at 19, at 39, there might be a problem. <laughs> but but you know what I mean, and and. One uh, <laughs> one that probably resonates the most with me is the, the world as we created it is a process of our thinking, and it cannot be changed without changing the way we think. And and that's an Albert Einstein. It, and I'm just a, a big believer in perspective. I'm a big believer of, of if you're always doing something the way you've always done it, you're never going to get a new result. But so many people live their life that way, whether it's you know the way they exercise, the way they interact and engage with their spouse, the way the effort they put into their work or their career. When you're beginning to get uncomfortable, you're on the right track. You know, unless it's something dumb, like someone's putting heroin in front of you. Well, your common sense is you, that uncomfortable feeling you have is is just, right? right. But if you're uncomfortable, if you're moving towards a venture or something that you know could have a positive outcome, that's usually a, a good place to a good place to be and stay in. Go ahead and give us a brief rundown of your bodybuilding career. Yeah, so I, you know, I would don't even know if I'd call it much as a career is is a something I looked into as more of a, a personal challenge. I was younger and kind of a funny story. I, I was bartending and working out, bachelor, like living the crazy wild guy bachelor life. And I was getting married, and, and one of my good friends, he's like, "Well, so you're gonna stop working out?" And I said, "Well, why?" Why would I? He's like, "Well, you only work out for the girls," which wasn't the reason, but that's that was his interpretation. And I was like, "No." But, you know, I'll still work out. And he said, why don't you go do one of those bodybuilding competitions? Or I said I would do that. And he said, no, you won't do that. You can, you're not committed enough to do it. And it sparked the fire that led me into uh, bodybuilding and pursuing that. And, you know, I look back on it now and I think there's a lot of it. that's It's crazy, the commitment that goes into it. But it's also incredibly rewarding in the sense of if you can put that commitment into something like a bodybuilding. So this, this is something I talk to athletes about is that level of commitment to the schedule, whether it's training or nutrition or whatever it is, you put that into somewhere else in your life that you want to go and you will not fail. It's a, it's a, it's a fail proof plan. Uh, And sometimes the difference is just understanding the plan. Actually, the next book I'm working on, it's called from lifting weights to lifting lives. And it talks about taking that athletic or athlete mindset through other things in life, whether it's relationship, career, primarily career and things like that. And understanding that if you follow those goals, 
where you're measuring everything, uh, you can't you can't lose. You really can't. The only time you'll lose is when you don't do what you've kind of committed to. That really taught me a lot about myself. It taught me a lot about putting in the effort. One of my favorite things to say is like, you know, do you want it bad enough? And when people complain, you can typically have a conversation, usually an uncomfortable conversation, which is usually a good conversation about how bad do they really want it. it comes from a box that they've kind of confined themselves with and understand if they want it bad enough, they have to break through those limiting walls they've put. And you learn all that going through bodybuilding, right? From putting on a little weight and throwing some weight around and getting your bench press up to 225. But when you take it to a whole nother level of uh, the committed lifestyle, it's, it's just, it's crazy, but it is, it is crazy. And it, it's not healthy in my opinion to do that specific lifestyle for a long time. But when you take that mindset and commitment and put it in other places of your life, you absolutely can't fail. hundred percent. That's fantastic. I would love to get into that transition specifically and how you specifically applied that to your business and to achieving goals in your life. But first I would like to talk about self-awareness and what, started you along that path of developing that and realizing the importance of self-awareness. And for anyone listening who doesn't struggle perhaps with alcohol per se, but maybe you have another vice that you aren't owning up to or you know what it is, um, this can still be applied, of course, to many different things. So tune in. I would love for you to share, Adam, uh, whatever you're willing to share, you know, some trying times and what led you to basically just your journey from then to now. Yeah. So, you know, I think for me, like I said earlier, that, that I spent 18 to 28 working in nightclubs, which is fun. Um, you know, drinking, hanging out, drinking was just what we did. If you were to picture your kind of kid rock video or like a, you know, just, you know, you see, you've seen the movies of, you know, you're just, you're having fun. It's girls and drinking and staying up late and doing wild stuff. And, and that was kind of the lifestyle. There's some people that never even do that, which is fantastic. And there's some people that do, and there's some people that grow out of it. And for me, alcohol was just one of those things that in my life that just, it didn't serve me. It probably did for a time as far as fun and, and things I was looking into. And because I was kind of so almost obsessed with the self-awareness, like how can I be better? And still to this day, you know, doing it, having massive changes in my life that we sometimes accept, like I said earlier, it's just the way we are, or who we are, or the way things are. And and so that's kind of how I looked at alcohol. And I think a lot of people do. And since I wrote my book, I've literally had thousands of people who have had these conversations of we just accept our relationship with alcohol is what it is. And some people have a bad relationship with alcohol. And in some cases, you know, it might be five people that are all friends. And they all have a bad relationship with alcohol, but because they all have a bad relationship with alcohol. It's okay, right? It's justified in the sense of like, oh man, we're all hung over Sunday. Yep. And, and it's like they don't realize that it is affecting other parts of their life. Other parts of their confidence is probably the biggest piece. And on a personal level, my father had a, a drinking issue. Uh, alcohol actually he drank himself to death. And and it really triggered something in me. I was thinking, you know, like I don't I don't ever want that to happen to me. And not that I think I had more self-control than to let that happen, but there's one way to have something definitely not happen is just remove it entirely. Things are good in my life. There wasn't a, a negative thing. And I just couldn't really figure out why alcohol made sense in my life other than that like social comfort of like, that's just what we do. I decided that, you know, I'm going to take alcohol out. And I told my wife, I was like, you know what? The summer's over. We lived in the lake. You're hanging out, drinking on the lake and doing those kind of things. It just was common for people to just kind of do kids back to school. And I went like 30 days and I was like, I don't miss it, 60 days. And then going through that process, you know, I, I spent some major time reflecting and, and looking at situations I'd overcome, meaning that I was a, a very social person. I usually get to do cool sporting events, concert events. I mean, I have a lot of celebrity clients and kind of big shot clients. I get invited to do a lot of cool things. And it's awkward when you're at a table with a bunch of famous people and everyone's ordering a drink and you're like, just water and, you know, the the room kind of stops, but what you, what you learn to realize is that it, it stops for a second in reality and moves on. But in your head, it can, it can freak you out and make you think you need a drink. So I went through a lot of those things and had journaled a lot of that stuff and wrote down a lot of things I went through. And then 90 days into it, I was, I, I said, I'll never drink again. I don't miss it. I don't need it. 
what are some physical benefits just right off the bat that somebody listening can say, well, that's good for you, but I like my whatever drink. And so what are some things that you noticed that were huge benefits in that process? There, there's a self-discovery piece. Like obviously, look, you save money, right? You're not spending money on alcohol True. and yeah. drinking. You're the, the risk of doing something dumb. Like, I don't know about you, but any bad decision, most bad decisions I've made, you know, from like a social level, we're usually done during alcohol, whether it's saying something stupid or there's so many, so many things you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about being at the concert, having to go to the bathroom all the time because you drink, you know, three or four beers, right? Like if you, if you have a bad relationship with alcohol, when you basically break up with alcohol, you realize how more confident you are. And, you know, people are like, I don't really drink them. And I tell them, go, go 30 days and let me know how hard it is. And you find out that you, you struggle with the social piece, like staying at home and doing that stuff. Easy peasy. Right. But when you actually have to like be social and everybody's like, what do you want? We find out how weak we are to feeling obligated to that. And so I take people through that process. And by the 90 days, they realize that they don't want to drink. They don't need drink. And they actually become, they like hate alcohol because they realize how weak it actually made them. And, and I'm talking like a lot of these people, I think this through this one on one intensive coaching, these are business leaders, top earner guys and girls. A few women have gone through it with me too. And what they realize is that it's their biggest, weakest spot in their life. Everywhere else they can tell people, no, they don't care what other people think. They're powerhouses, yeah. decision-making leaders that stomp through anything except for when someone offers them a drink and they don't want one, they still take one. And so you go through that and that confidence that comes with that backside of that conversation that we dive into one thing I want to add in there is that transition period. Uh, I mean, it can be really awkward. And I love that you said that it really reveals to you how weak you really are to the point where your self-esteem is low around that area because you're not used to saying no. Everyone's grabbing a cocktail. You want to join the party. It's normal. Yeah. I mean, a lot of business owners, type A personalities, we're high achievers. We like to unwind. And sometimes that involves like a drink or two. And for that habit, which is extremely common in, in, in high achieving circles, especially, you know, just to take a little bit of the edge off. What's your word of advice? I know for, for me in terms of diet, big thing is just replacement, you know, replace ice cream with sweet fruit, like pineapple, kiwi, strawberries, nice and ripe. Just cut it up, have it ready for you when you're hungry. And for the sweet tooth, a well-known founder, Kevin Rose, he spoke on this, how he cut out alcohol with that awkward phase. I'm really curious to hear your opinion, Adam. He recommended to ask the bartender for a cocktail glass, have water in it, put a lime wedge on the side and put a black straw in it just to keep people from asking you like, oh, aren't you going to drink? I wonder what your thoughts are around that. Yeah. What you just said is a great way into it. People just want you to have something in their hand, like in your hand. That's it. If I'm standing next to you and I have a beer and you don't, and we're at like a social gathering, it just bugs people that you don't have something in your hand. So I usually tell people like grab a diet Coke instead. And you know, it look look like a rum and Coke or whatever, or just grab something, throw a lime on it, just like that, like soda water. I drink a ton of LaCroix, so I love sparkling water. You might not see half these people ever again in your life. That's a great way to just kind of cruise through it. We have this perception that people care or pay attention like a hundred times more than they actually do, especially in a group setting. You know, it, it, we, we worry so much about what are they going to think, like their outfit, right? Like think of there's times I'll admit to doing it where I'm like, well, what about this? I think I just did it yesterday before church. Like this shirt, that shirt, I'm asking my wife and I'm like, at the end of the day, that doesn't matter. <laughs> no one cares. No one's going to remember what I wore at church yesterday. Yeah. And it's, you know, but we, we eat ourselves up on that stuff. The same thing goes with like the drinking. You just have a glass in your hand. Stay away from the guys doing shots, and you can usually navigate it pretty well. When you see guys ordering shots, take a bathroom break. Tell the waitress, you know, maybe throw her a 20 and just tell her to bring you, you know, club soda and a straw of the lime every time, no matter what. I'd love to get into now, transition into how you applied your bodybuilding work ethic and drive into your businesses. Share with us what that looks like, how you took that drive and applied it to business. Because for me personally, it wasn't until I did that, uh, at least at the level I have, that anything got done. I've always been super disciplined with going to the gym, following workout routines. I used to log every weight, every exercise. I don't do that anymore, but I saw a lot of progress. I was a pole vaulter, so I had a stronger upper body, and I was really, really dedicated to that. Uh, other areas of my life kind of took a hit 
because of it, because I was so dedicated. But once I took that and applied it to more business and life goals, I saw a lot of positive changes for you, what that looked like and how someone can do that. There are guys who do have what it takes and and they crush it in the gym. And then they just feel maybe inadequate in other areas like building a business. They're like, I have no idea you know, how to apply this drive to my daily life. What would you share with them? When I was heavily focused on bodybuilding, I was probably not a very good husband. And uh, I, I probably wasn't a very good father. My son was, was newborn. I was always, it was like me, 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 the gym, my food, uh, you know, whatever. Like and you're hyper-focused on your results and you're weighing yourself throughout the day and, and all that kind of stuff where there's some good and some bad to it in that particular situation. I, it wasn't good for me, and, and I don't think it's healthy for people to do long term. I think it's fun to do it and try it because it's it's good to like push yourself so you can kind of look back and remember what you were capable of doing in times of questioning what you're capable of doing moving forward. And so for me, there's two parts of how I applied it. You don't make any money bodybuilding. So what I did is when I when I started my the first business, which is a hormone replacement therapy clinic, is because I realized I was at this bodybuilding competition and everybody, it's a, a master, so it's 35 and up, uh, no one younger, which is kind of cool. And I tell these people, and I, and I know a ton of them are abusing steroids and, and probably just not getting the best advice, even if they're not abusing stuff. And I thought they're going to need an outlet later of so to get back to normal, right? They're, they're going to, and so, and so that, that's where I actually created that first business was in that area. I had some doctors that I was friends with that understood the space. And I said, the goal is to get these people who are taking crazy amounts of stuff eventually are going to have to stop and transitioning through like a regular you know, testosterone replacement therapy, regular hormone replacement therapy program, men and women to allow them to kind of live that high-end physical life. When you're abusing and you come off that stuff, your hormones are in the tank. And if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to get things back, you're in bad, bad, bad shape for a long time, possibly forever, depression, even all kinds of stuff. So I created a clinic initially to do that. Fast forward almost a decade. We don't work with people in that space as much. We work with people just more about longevity, health, optimizing your lifestyle type mentality. But I share that because what I did is I, I figured something I really loved was the bodybuilding fitness industry and see, figured out a way to where I could make money in it. I wasn't a business person. I, I don't have a business degree. No one ever showed me how to run a business. So the uphill battle was tough. And I'm fortunate for it and, and grateful for it because it teaches you a lot of stuff. And two things, it, it allowed me firsthand to fail at a lot of stuff and not quit, right? It also allowed me to be able to work with younger people and younger entrepreneurs and, and kind of people starting out and having like a reality, the things you're thinking of doing, I can tell you, yay or nay or it won't work or why it won't work because I, I did a lot of that stuff there's a grind grit piece that's in the beginning of every business that you can only learn on yourself and it teaches you as you build more businesses you can do it better faster transitioning into self-awareness it's even in your bio on your website what are some things you did to increase your self-awareness was it mostly reading was it introspection was it solitude what are some things that you did to acutely increase it and, and, and what did that process look like? If you would be willing to share uh, many, any dark times that really push you to get to where you are today. That's a great question. The self-awareness only way to even start sipping on the, the wonderful drink of self-awareness is to acknowledge that there's more out there, right? There's so many people that they don't believe there's more out there. Right. That, and, and I mean, not just out there, but in there, meaning inside of you. Right. And so it, it's the, I would say the plague of misery is the lack of self awareness, really, because you think you're only worth something. You think you're only capable of something, right, from a self standpoint. And you live this life that inside of us is screaming for more. Right. And it's not just about like, I need that Louis Vuitton purse or I need that Lamborghini. It's about, I need to know that I can doing the best I can. And if I don't do the best I can, I'm usually going to find things like sex or alcohol or drugs or some other thing. But if you don't know any better, you don't know, but there it's, it's inside of all of us and it will, it will burn whether you ignore it or not. 
And so I spent a lot of time, you're, you're very right with the reading. I think I probably read like 300 books and that really, really opened my eyes to things because when you're reading, I did the audio books and you're listening to somebody and you're open, right? To have that, if you have to be open to being uncomfortable. If you start getting uncomfortable and some things start hitting home and you're like, the hell with this book, this, this makes me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, that you're you're not going to go anywhere. But when it does start making you feel uncomfortable and, and you're not like, oh, that's my friend Jim or, oh, oh, yeah, my mom was like that. And you start thinking like, how are you? Like you need to reflect 100% in these books that run it when something starts making you feel uncomfortable. It allows you to change your perspective. And, and perspective is so important because it's all how we perceive the world. You know, I could ask you like, what's a lot of money, Jonathan, right? Like if I, if I asked you to write a check for $10,000 today, would that maybe you wouldn't be able to, or maybe it'd be like a significant thing, or you might just do it without thinking, right? And, and it's so I say that in the sense of when people talk about what's a lot of money or what's hard, what's easy, all those things. And, and you, you learn what you're capable of and kind of back to the bodybuilding thing. Uh, it, it teaches you that you, you're capable of so much more, right? There's, we just limit ourselves maybe like, well, I only had this kind of education, um, you know, and I did this personally, right? I grew up with, I grew up, I didn't have much money. Uh, I grew up uh, with a single mom, secretary, trying to raise two boys. My dad was gone. Um, and he, like I said, he was an alcoholic. Uh, I barely graduated high school. Uh, college was not even an option. So and all these things that I told myself for years, almost like a pity party that were like, why you can't do stuff. And I think a lot of people do it. And that's why I like to share it because it's bold. The reality is, is what you choose to do every single day, you're either all in on yourself or you're not. If you yearn for more, you got to go get more. You know, like you said, reading, getting uncomfortable, trying new things, making new friends. You see like Grant Cardone, stuff they talk about. This, it's all. Um, I do think people got to take a break from those guys and, and actually practice, yeah, practice yeah, yeah, what yeah. they're listening to. You know what I mean? Yeah, like Grant, I love both of them. But. Yeah, Grant, my imitation of Grant is yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. That's how he talks. Yeah. And, and those guys have some great content. The, yep. the, the key thing, though, is getting out there and finding out who you are in that space. It's all kind of right. You know what I mean? It's all the right direction. But you got to tap into to you. Uh, and that's where the self-awareness comes into uh, yep. to find out like what what you want to do and what you're capable of. I want to share that quote you mentioned, the quiet desperation. While Henry David Thoreau is often credited with variations of it, I think the quote was like, most men lead lives of quiet desperation and die with their song still inside them. Actually, I think Thoreau might have said the massive men lead lives of quiet desperation. Have you ever heard of The Buried Life? No, I don't think so. You would really enjoy that. This group of like four guys no. that wrote a bucket list, and on the bucket list, it included play basketball with President Obama. There were things like that, and they literally yeah. accomp- they literally did it. Just because they said, and there's are guys like post college. They just decided that they weren't going to wait till they were like you know 50 to change things up, and they got an MTV show out of it for like well, four think, years. That's awesome. Yeah, I think today, like my my son watches the Dude Perfect guys. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, them. Yeah, they just yeah. do like epic. Yeah. They like throw footballs and do all kinds. Of, yeah, but I, I don't even know what they do specifically. But they make millions of dollars. There's so much opportunity for oh, you awesome. to do whatever you want and it's unreal. figure out how to make a decent living. But you can't go try to be like, I'm not going to go try to be a YouTube celebrity or I'm not going to go do it because it's just not really in my heart to do. There's some things that I'm working on that are in my heart, things I know that I'm good at doing. Uh, but it's taken some time to figure that out. And you got to, and that's the part of doing it pursue it and find out what what it is like bodybuilding wasn't my thing i wanted to do business i've got a business in the fitness space and through doing that i've grown to be a halfway decent business person right but i'm constantly learning and i've been so fortunate most importantly to have a great mentors and great, great network of, of people and always treating people well has always treated me well you're a very grounded man i could tell just by speaking with you what's interesting to me I asked a previous guest this question as well, was essentially, why do you think it's so hard and uncomfortable for us to go to a place of actually taking care of ourselves at a deeper level and working on self-awareness when we already know logically that it will enhance our career, enhance our, our business? Why do you think it's still so hard for people to go there? 
I think it's hard because you got to deal with the truth. And uh, we don't we don't really like the truth that much. Uh, that's why we watch TV and that's why we play around on social media and that's why we play video games and that's why we like to watch movies. It's all an escape from the truth. Those things in themselves too are also a problem that keeps us further away from that self-awareness, being obsessed with watching the game and alcohol is a huge part of it, huge part of it. If you're always knocking back three or four beers a day, you are never going to have that self-awareness. I mean, it's, it's borderline impossible if you need it, right? Not everybody needs it. People do have it. You know, like I said, the alcohol, my wife still drinks a glass of wine or two, you know, every other night. It doesn't have an effect on her. So just to tie the alcohol into that conversation. Uh, but the, the self-awareness piece is when we look into ourselves and we kind of say, hey, Jonathan, uh, your your goals and dreams are, are this, but here's kind of your activity. And then you're like, I'm 100% to blame yeah, for no not excuses. achieving my stuff, right? So that's why it's it, it, it just – because we're not tough. We're weak. People that, that I work with, like I said, I do the one-on-one -on -one coaching. Right off the bat, I'm like, listen, if you're not ready to hear how terrible things are and prepared for a way brighter future, I, I won't waste your money or my time. Like, like you just mentioned, it's, it's great that you're, you're in tune with that because it's the first hurdle. Is there's so many people, even with my clinic, they want help. And I'm like, well, tell me about your lifestyle. I don't go to the gym. I don't eat well, I'm 40 pounds overweight, and I just won't work with them because they want a magic pill. They don't want to actually change their life. And so, and I think, it, like I said, it, it's just the fear of actually having to take accountability for yourself. It just scares people because they realize that they're not trapped. They realize all their excuses are bullshit. And, and then they're like, Ooh, you know, they, they got to move and they don't want to move. It's uncomfortable. Doing what you say you're going to do. Most people don't do that. I'm guilty of it every day for certain areas. Mm -hmm. The listeners being high achievers, business owners, people who are just kind of looking for that extra little push, that extra little nudge, as they say. One thing I struggle with, Adam, is not owning up or being responsible for my sleep schedule. I get really wound up and sometimes in a project and I would look up and it's like two in the morning and I say, man, I know I got to get to sleep, but I really want to pound this out. And it kind of happens night after night. And before I know it, like three weeks have gone by and I don't know what day it is. And I know better. I know if I go to bed at 10 and get up at five, my day will be more productive. I'll be healthier and get more done. What would you, what would you share with somebody like me? Who's, they got a lot of things in order. If you want to say they're not take they're not making excuses as much as the magic pill type of people, but they are still kind of being held back by those little, but big things that are still lingering, holding them back. Yeah, I think it's a good question. And it's funny you're mentioning because I'm, I'm looking at the schedule I've had to make for myself. Discipline is the foundation, the core to all great things, accomplishment and happiness. It goes to discipline. It's my favorite word. And so what I did for myself is I made a time schedule. So it's, this could be something that helps you where I get up at 6 a.m. and I lights out at 11. When you don't structure it all, there's the little things that do very much matter like for me personally, it's reading my Bible. I like to make sure that I, I spend some time in there. I'm a man of faith. And that if I sleep in and skip that piece, I don't get to do that. And and for someone that's the faith is very important to them, what's that say about me? Because I make time for lunch and I'll make time to go to the gym and I'll make time to, you know, to do those other things. And so I, I made it and I'll send you a picture of it. You can check it out later. But I just awesome. a little a schedule that's like from this time to this, you know, and this is my, my son's out of school now, but you know, like six thirty to 8 AM is kids in work, right? I'll get the kids ready. They're five and 10. I'm I can still, I'm in my office. I work from home typically. So it's easy. Eight to nine, I go to the gym or eight to nine 30, go to the gym. And right. I don't watch TV much. And, and I'm very fortunate that my wife is, she's kind of a workaholic too. And we spend our evenings after the kids go to bed with our laptops up with whatever's on the TV, not paying attention to it. But I'm trying to put some different some time in there to read. In a nutshell, just structuring it and saying from this time to this time, that's what I work on. When it hits three o'clock, you're done with your projects and you have to go back to the other thing, right? And, and right. so for it, bedtime, it's shutting it down and just knowing like it, if it's midnight, you want to call quits, it's midnight. You know at 1149, flipping that laptop down and you're walking away. It's important but and you'll, you'll respect your own time more. That really impacted me that you just said that last line. 
Yeah. And, and that will reflect project through your own business and the quality of clients. When you respect your time more, other people will respect your services more and your time more, thus increasing oh, the abundance in your life. You can't uh, get time back. You can make, you can make money all day long. Uh, I'm pretty fanatical about that stuff. I don't mm -hmm. do things I don't want to do. I won't go places I don't want to go because it's my time. I don't get, you know, if it makes someone else happy, like my wife wants to go to a restaurant, of course I go. Right. But it's important to do that because if you don't do it with yourself, you, you let everyone else control your time. Let me ask you this. I'm really curious to hear your answer around this, Adam. Peter Drucker in The Effective Executive, it's a book that he wrote. I actually journaled on this topic from the book because it hit me the hardest out of all the points. It's a very short read. Basically, he says, at that time, it's going to happen. So you shut your laptop at 12 or 11.50, 10 of, and you do that to a fault. Do you really do that even if like, because for me, it's hard to stop because I'm thinking to myself, I talk myself into keeping going because I'm like, oh, well, I'm, I'm feeling in the flow and I think I'm getting a lot done. Do you really stick to that to a fault? And do you recommend sticking to that to a fault just for the building of confidence, congruency and habit? Yeah, I think it's good. But like you said, there's different situations. Maybe this will help you too. Where I kind of have building phases of business where I'm a maniac. Like I don't sleep. I'm like stressed out. I'm, I'm doing tons of stuff. But I know because I've done it multiple times that the end is coming or I have like a big unwind. So for example, I'm going on vacation uh, tomorrow for like six days with my family. I'm going to probably pretty much unplug but when I come back, I'll go in what I call psychopath mode where <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm up and I'm doing whatever it takes. I'll set work goals, meaning, all right, I need to map out the day 10 through 20. If I'm flowing and it's going, I won't let up. But if I'm fighting to try to do it, to get it done, then I'll quit. Right. And you've got to, that's where it goes back to self-awareness is knowing like if you're in the flow and you're, dude, I'd write a book when, and I would say, I'd spend two hours, two nights a week from nine o'clock till 11 or 12 o'clock at night for six months almost. And if it flowed over, I'd flow over. And sometimes you get done, your brain's zipping and you just need a time out. And I'll just, that's the only time I, you know, I'll throw some stupid thing on TV or something like that just to shift the brain, you know. But I, the, the important time also to make time to have, to have just quiet time and free time because that's when the ideas come to you. Uh, when you're, when you're, in the mix is never when it really comes. It's usually when you step back. And that's one thing patience has, has taught me. If you're just trying to be busy, hang it up. I like to live by work hard, rest hard. Work hard and rest hard. A lot of people who are listening right now may be dealing with, dealing with uh, an intense amount of ambition and they're not sure how to balance that with a healthy lifestyle. So I want to transition, segue into the heart healthy hustle round. We'll ask you a series of questions mm -hmm. based off the name of the show. Are you ready for the Heart Healthy Hustle Round? Let's do it. Let's do it. For Heart, what activity do you use to care for and strengthen your internal character? You know, this can be uh, morning devotions. You said you're a man of faith. It could be solitude, silence, reflection. Reminding myself of, of faith. And, and, and I think for me, I'm not going to preach to the listeners, but for me be, being a, a, you know, I believe in God and that it, it's sometimes for me as a, a foundation, a platform to go to, to remember, like, I'm not in control of everything. Right. So like we can all probably relate to that and understand, like, you can only control so many things in life, but you can control your attitude. You can, can control your belief system. You can control your action, but there's certain things you can't control. So when I stay focused in that space, I kind of call it like walking with God all the time is, is I realize that there's things I can't control. So I can't get upset, can't get stressed. I don't worry about it. Like I'm the most even keeled. It's funny when people meet me, they're like, how are you so chill all the time? <laughs> Just because different, but because I, I realize what I can and can't control. And I believe that it all works out in the end. Everything works out how it's supposed to. The other part is um, music. I, I love music. I listen to music like all day while I work and just listening to positive stuff. I don't listen to, I used to love rap, like rap music and hardcore heavy metal whatever just but I, I realized it didn't necessarily put my my mind in the right state of mind so music's very important to me because it just it just keeps you uplifted right and then movement is is the most important thing i love you know whatever it might yeah. be that playing soccer with my son like i need i need to feel my physical body like working yeah, and absolutely. also get that blood flow like that's when problems get solved 
that's perfect transition into the next category, which is health. How do you maintain your physical health? Yeah. So I'll give you from a nutrition standpoint is I, I do intermittent fasting between so Sunday through Friday. So I don't eat until afternoon. Um, and I stop eating at like eight 30. Do you have coffee and, though and in do, the morning? Yep. Yeah. Just black coffee, black coffee or water every day. And so what, what okay. I was going to say, what, what's kind of funny today is I haven't eaten yet today. And so it's three 30, uh, central time for me. And I still have not had food today. And so you, that you would be kind of focus? a nutshell. What's that? I asked, do you notice increased focus with the intermittent fasting? Oh yeah. Way more energy. Wow. Uh, I, I'll tell you, man, when you're hungry and, and, and physically and kind of metaphorically speaking, you'll grind more. Hopefully that sums up the health piece for you. Yeah, for sure. With breakfast, for me, I feel like I have to eat or else my muscle won't recover. That being said, I'm sure you have ways around that. One thing I do enjoy is eating a big breakfast most of the time and living off of that until maybe I skip lunch. Like you said, there's a lot of guys, a lot of high achievers I know, men and women alike, who once they get working, it's exactly that. They don't want to eat a big meal because they feel you know so full. They're just put you in almost a relaxed state of mind. Like I don't know if it's serotonin, mm-hmm. but there's hormones involved, as you know, with your clinic there. But I remember in high school, I had so many jobs. One of them, we were out working construction. Uh, I was working for my buddy's dad. There's the three of us in the Hamptons on Long Island in New York. And basically, we went out there and we would just go from like 6 a.m. for like 14-hour days for like the whole week. And most of the reason that we lost weight, but we were going so hard that the focus was incredible. Like as the day went on, We were just getting, like you said, like more and more focused, more and more done. And it was like this momentum effect where you just start feeding off the motivation of the fact that you are able to say no to needing to stop for an hour to go sit at Chick-fil-A or sit at a restaurant and eat some food. But of course, at the end of the day, we'd have a great dinner, you know, salad, grilled chicken, you know, a nice beer or (laughs) shouldn't say that with you on the show. But you know what I mean? Like we had had a good fill at the end of the day, healthy, gave us fuel for, for the next day. And Appreciate your insight there into the health category. That is the cornerstone of the show, you know, trying to have people not only in a physical sense, but also that self-awareness of pursuing their hustle with health and how to do that. So uh, it's invaluable insight. Thank you. For hustle, uh, I want to ask you, what's your main motivation for doing what you do, Adam? You know, hustling to the max of your potential. It's interesting uh, question because it was a conversation I had over the weekend with my younger brother. Him and I are very different. And he's kind of like you've always been you wanted more, more, more. And, and through this conversation, it, it helped me realize some things. Through our, he was three and a half years younger. And so he, his perspective of, of life when we were young was a little bit more different than mine. I saw a lot of my mom struggle as a single parent uh, financially, um, not being able to do things. Growing up with people telling you, uh, you can't afford to play sports. So I, could, I couldn't play. And, and telling you, you can't do this. You're not, you know, look, just you know, I look back at with a lot of people telling me things I couldn't do. And I, and I grew up with that financial struggle and fear of like, are bills going to be paid? Like, you know, we lost our house. You think of those kind of situations um, that, and a lot of people have things a lot worse, right? And a lot of people like can't even relate to that uh, because they never had that worry, which is, which is great. But for, but for me, it's something that has always burned me. Like every single day I wake up broke in my head, right? Every day, it's all going to go away. And, and I have that mentality and it. And I've, I have a healthy grasp of that because it's, because it's, it's no longer fear. It's more long, it's, it's motivation, but it was fear for a long time, uh, mm-hmm. growing up. And, and even in my twenties, you know, what I, what I realized is that a, a reactive life is a losing life because you're always reacting to your circumstances. If you're in a proactive life and that's why I run hard. So like people are like, how do you do with the business and I didn't, I didn't go into like the charity that I have and the, the different things like that. So there's, there's a ton on my plate and probably too much on my plate. But part of me, what, what I realized is the more I'm doing, the more I'm creating, the more I'm involved in, the more I'm pushing, uh, things that I do, the more proactive I'm being. And I create more problems than life can throw at me. Right. And when you create your problems, you can manage them a bit more. When you don't do anything and you're reactive and you live a, a reactive life, meaning that you just go through your day to day, everything's the same. 
when problems come your way, a flat tire or a, a breakup or a death in the family, whatever it might be, they're like a wrecking ball coming to your face because you never have to deal with adversity because you, I say hide from it, but you don't put yourself in the in harm's way. And I think as an entrepreneur, and you may be able to relate to this, I realized that if I'm always putting myself out there, I'm going to get stronger. I realized that living a proactive life over a reactive life is much more fruitful, much more promising, and there's a lot more happiness that comes with it. Hopefully that answers your question on the on the hustle. Just growing up and living with someone, um, and it's not knocking my mom, it's just who she was. I love her. She's great. But she lived in a reactive life. Of, yeah. As life turned things to her, she responded. And I realized that if I go after it, it doesn't have a chance to, to turn on me. I kind of get to control the outcome a bit more. Yeah, certainty is a complete illusion. However, when you're on the offensive and you're proactive instead of reactive, you get to integrate self-awareness and your life is a lot fuller, a lot richer. I am curious how you maintain a mindset of abundance while also maintaining that stay broke always hungry mentality. Well, I just realized it, it's, like I said, it used to be probably an unhealthy uh, mentality. And so for me, it's the abundance piece also comes back to uh, being faith-based. Uh, and and I spend a lot of time in gratitude. So I realize how blessed I am. I realize I'm super grateful for every day of my life. And, and you know, when I can look back though, you know, I kind of think of, there's like the gap between where you want to be and the gap where you came from. And the, I guess the, the waking up kind of broke mentality is, is every day though, I, I wake up in a sense of seeing where I want to be instead of being happy or I, I shouldn't say happy, complacent to where I'm at. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the, the, I can look back and, and realize that I've achieved so much more in life that I ever thought I was capable of doing. Gorgeous wife, these awesome kids, like, it's crazy. It, blow, it blows me away. And I know that, and I know because when I connect with people I grew up with and stuff, they're blown away too. You know what I mean? Being able to have the the two remembering where you came from type thing um, and never wanting to go back there will always remind you to get your ass out of bed. Remembering where you came from will also keep you humble and, and grateful. Benjamin Franklin had a lot to say about complacency and how it is borderline toxic. Oh, you know, absolutely. I love that you just touched on that. Not that you ever reach a point of arrival. You know, it's a constant state of pushing and achievement. However, there is certain levels of arrival, so to speak. What's an encouraging word you would say to a lonely entrepreneur? They're having trouble balancing their ambition with their with their health and all areas and facets of their life. What would you share with them to encourage them to keep pressing on and it'll all work out? I think the getting really clear on what you want to do and connecting with some some people that have already done that that's one of the most important things i think just i do try to mentor some some younger people i also work with the youth group at my church but with those younger entrepreneurs i think the message is you know understanding that patience is is probably like one of the biggest things in the world because that's the, the probably one of the biggest issues i struggled with is like you're now 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 and then also just understanding that connecting with the people that have already done it, doing some stuff for them will help you learn about uh, a lot about what maybe you want to do. It's a fast track. You know, I put myself in a position where my kind of most recent venture, my business partner is an awesome, awesome guy, very successful. And to the point to where I was like, what in the hell does this guy want to do with me? And he's just like, you're good, man. I believe in you. And I was like, oh, all right. Let's do it. And those things come with time, but connecting to those kind of people that have already done a lot of that stuff is super important, but bring value. You know, I've had guys that reach out to me that are younger that want to, they're like, I'm like, Hey, well, shoot me an email. We'll schedule a time. And they're like, well, you know, school, pretty busy with school. And I'm like, listen, dude, school's kicking your ass. We got nothing to talk about. <laughs> there's, no, there's no starting. To, you're not going to, you, I was like, if you, if you think I, I have time yeah. to, you know what I mean? It's just, it, they, they're so far out of the, the space, but hopefully that answers your question. I think I jumped yeah, around a lot. For sure. And so transitioning uh, to the conclusion point of the show, share with my audience three of your most influential books and why. The first book that I kind of read that started my the fire, I guess, was a book called The Power of Consistency by Weldon Long. And he was a guy who kind of grew up in and out of jail 
uh, had a son and he decided he wanted to get out of jail and see his son. And by the time he, he started learning just different things, he read a lot of books. And one of the, the second book I'll mention is the book, one of the books he read. Um, and in any way, he turned around and developed the multi-million dollar business in Colorado. It's a great book, but the reason that book's so important to me is it, it got, it made me realize like there's a lot of value in these books, right? Cause I wasn't good in school. I hated school. Like reading to me, was like miserable, but I do the audio books on my schedule. I'm slotting time to actually read some physical books. That book to me really opened my eyes because he talks about breaking down that box of talking to someone and I'm like, you know, someone who could be anything in the world, but they decide to be so much less because they only believe that they are capable of that box they've created. So the, the book really talks about breaking down that personal box and being whatever you want to be, not being who you've always been or the family you came from, the area you grew up in. Uh, whatever, right? Which leads me to the second book, really kind of set the explosion for me in the self discovery and understanding because it, it's hard. Like, you you know, you might see your neighbor who's doing real well and they're, you know, 10, 12, 15 years older than you, driving the nice car, have, happy life. And, and some of the things you don't, you're like, how do I get there, right? Like, you, you don't get the same haircut as him and you can buy the same car and you might not be able to afford it. Uh, you don't want to dress the same as him. There's other things, right? And, and so this book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by S Stephen Covey is phenomenal. I would say next to the Bible, the second best book ever written and should be in every school and everybody should be forced to read it and take tests on it and they should have to get 100% on the test to understand this book because it, it really, really, really outlines simply the things that are required to live well and be happy. And then the, the third book will always be one of my favorites and it's not for everybody. And it's called Relentless by Tim Grover. And I'm actually happy to see he's kind of getting some buzz going. He wrote this book a few years ago, but he's getting a lot more buzz going on uh, social media and things like that. And he, cause it's, it's awesome. His book is awesome. And what his book did for me is, you know, there's a lot of times in life we go through and you mentioned like the lonely entrepreneur and uh, there's probably some listeners out there that are like questioning, is this for me? Am I supposed to be doing this? Cause everybody in your life is telling you you're different or you're strange. You have trouble relating to people. Like I can hang out with anybody, but I don't enjoy hanging out with most people. I, I really like getting into intellectual people and really diving in. And what the book did for me, relentless was made me realize that who I am is okay. Right? Like, I'm a psychopath. I, I see the world through my eyes. I see things a certain way. I believe things should be a certain way. And for, for so much of my life, I always thought like I was just wrong or weird or different. But the reality is, is that being wired that way is what's allowed me to do the things I've done and overcome the things I've overcome and continue to grow into the person I am today. And so that book, Relentless, is awesome. For the listeners who don't know, Tim Grover, I have not read Relentless. I It's definitely on my list now. He was Michael Jordan's personal trainer for I don't know how many years. Was it over 20, I believe? Is that right? Yeah, for most of the career. Uh, and one funny thing with Tim Grover, is he always asked the Bulls to be like the team trainer or work with some of the guys. He never once asked to be Michael Jordan's because he didn't think mm -hmm. he didn't think he could do it. And then wow. he finally did he do Michael Jordan. Yeah, and he worked with Kobe. He worked with... Uh, Dwayne Wade, a ton of people, a ton of people. But he just has that, like I said earlier when I talk about some of the, the, the folks that I work with through this kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching is I'm I'm not like a, well, let's talk about your feelings. Like I only like to work with, you got to be able to take that tough talk and that's how this guy works. And it made me realize like, that's okay. That's the way I'm wired. And people that are wired that way love working with me. People that want to spend half the time talking about like, it's okay. Your past is, uh, you know, like that. I, I just <laughs> I don't do well with that stuff. Cause I had the same thing, right? If I lived, if I spent my life talking about how my past made me a certain way in a negative way, you just don't go anywhere in life, right? If anything, you're grateful for the challenges, you're grateful for the hurdles and it's time to get up and, and move. And, uh, that book really talks about stuff like that and the personalities that go behind people in that space. Great book recommendations phenomenal. I have read only one of them. So I'm excited to check out those other two. And I never finished the seven habits. I never finished that book. So those are the seventh habit. Finish what you start. <laughs> oh my gosh. You're right. <laughs> I'm joking, but it might've been part of it. Yeah, finish that book. Oh, sure. Sure. It is for start sure. Over. 
awesome. Yeah, and I'm something that I just want to touch on. You basically said it, but Tim Grover, imagine the level of tenacity and grit that you'd have to have to be able to push these psychopathic athletes such as Kobe, Michael Jordan, Dwayne Wade. That's uh, legendary status. Wrapping up the show here, my favorite question, what I'm calling the park bench paradigm. If you had 60 seconds, give or take, with your 25-year-old self going back and just sitting on the bench with him, your current self, uh, using the pronoun you, what would you mm-hmm. what would, what would you say to you, young Adam? You know, if you could look over Adam, put your hand on his shoulder, and say anything, what would you tell him, and why? That's a great question, uh, and I like it a lot. The first thing I would say is stop distracting yourself with bullshit, right? Like when you're young, I think we just spend so much time, whether it's worrying about how many likes we got on a post or you know, like for me, it was like girls and partying and, and it, I just realized it's such a distraction takes away from you exploring your potential. And so I think I would tell the younger Adam to get focused on what you really want in your future, because you can have it. You can have every single nibble of it. Everything is yours unless you're not focused. Um, I'd say number two would be, I would, tell, I would say to be patient um, and Remember, there's only certain things you can control, and if you try to control the rest of the stuff, you're just going to go nuts. That's where anxiety comes from. That's why we have an anxiety problem in this country um, and probably in this world. And I would say that when presented with the easy way or the best way, always go the best way. And if you're not sure what's the best way, keep thinking about it. Keep working on it until you figure out what the best way is. Because I think when I was yeah, – I look, I see this as the – especially young entrepreneurs is they're like – well, I did 50,000 in sales this year. I'll do 500 next year and 5 million the next year. And I'm like, and, and I get it because I thought the same way. And I'm like, how the, how do you think this is going to happen? Like you're nuts. Go take a step back and really figure out how this is going to work and, you know, and, and go through. And because, and that what will happen is that's their goal. So they'll go after the easy option and it never works. Like almost never. Sometimes you get lucky, but never for me. That's powerful and that's impactful. And I appreciate you sharing that. How can my listeners connect with you, get in touch with you? Um, everybody listening, of course, I want you to go ahead and check out Adam on social media, but also um, check out his book, Better Than The Binge. You can find it at betterthanthebinge.com. Um, and there's a great bio if you want to learn more about Adam on that website as well. But uh, go ahead, Adam, open floor with uh, any, any, any projects you're working on, anything getting you out of bed in the morning currently. Next month, I'll start. We're going to start building out my uh, my ninety day program for uh, for folks to download to kind of do it. Takes them through a ninety day uh, course of not drinking and kind of self reflection. A lot of the stuff that I've just had so much success with doing it on these one on ones that I want to be able to offer it to more people because it's super impactful. Um, and I think it's it's really some legacy stuff that I'm working on. So that that's coming up. Uh, I think that yeah, if any of your listeners are interested to hear about hormone replacement therapy, they can email me, adam at renewliferx.com. If uh, anyone has any questions about alcohol or my book or anything around that space, they can email me, uh, adam at betterthanthebinge.com. And uh, I hope that they, everyone that's listened finds a little bit of value and, and something to take out of it to, to apply in their life. Because you got to apply it. I really appreciate your time here. Adam, thank you for being on the show today. Appreciate you so much, Jonathan. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Heart Healthy Hustle podcast. If you made it to the end of this episode, I want to say thank you. And also, I want you to ask yourself why. What about this episode really stood out to you? I want to challenge you to take action on that thing. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate your time and consideration to go ahead and leave a helpful review in iTunes. So it really helps the podcast grow and we can impact even more people who need this. Thank you guys for all of your support and I will see you in the next episode.